Welcome to our English worship this morning. About six months ago, we began a sermon series on the Lord's Prayer, right in the middle of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in Matthew six. And the Lord's Prayer goes something like this: Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we have forgiven our debtors. And finally, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So, after six months of hard work, we have come to the last sentence of the Lord's Prayer: "Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one." Now, if you were with us two weeks ago, you will remember this petition is better translated as. And force us not into temptation, as our old master Satan did, but deliver us from the evil one. So what we are pleading to the Father is to deliver us from Satan's temptation. Now I wonder if you have ever tried to pray very earnestly for this deliverance, deliverance from Satan's temptation. And when you do pray earnestly for that. What pictures may come into your mind? Well, this week, as I was thinking through this sermon, two iconic picture came to my mind. Two iconic picture from Afghanistan.、Uh, the first picture is a U.S. rescue flight, jam packed and far exceeded its capacity. It was supposed to hold about what 134 people, but now is holding 600 plus. And then there is the second picture of the masses of people outside trying desperately to get into the plane to escape from the great danger on the ground. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Deliver us from Satan's temptation. Let's get on the flight. Let's get out of this land, out of all these temptations. Now that's what you should be thinking about as you pray. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And listen, I think this should be what the church should be like every day. The church should be jam packed. There should be row room here, even with COVID,、uh, social distancing. The church should be jam packed. People should be coming and lining up in our church, trying to come into the church because it's dangerous outside. Because only the church, only the gospel, can get us out of the evil one, the evil one's temptation. But why is it not so? Why is the church not jam packed? Why there are not people lining outside of the church trying to get in? And that's because Satan is a far better liar than the Taliban. So imagine if the Taliban get on this flight, this jam-packed flight, trying to depart from Afghanistan, and that the Taliban trying to convince them, we have changed. Twenty years have passed. We 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 have modernized. We we are good people. We won't persecute anybody. Everything is forgotten. Will anyone believe in the Taliban and stay in Afghanistan? The answer is, is hardly anyone will listen to it. But yet today, listen. Satan has managed to convince everyone not to listen to the gospel and not to believe in the gospel, not realizing the great spiritual danger we are in. Whether you are in Afghanistan or in America or in the UK or in Hong Kong, is a great danger all over the place. So we ask, what is the temptation overcoming life?、Now、let me give you the answer. Uh, you know,、uh, a front. The temptation overcoming life is a life that gets on the flight, stay on the flight, and hold on to the flight to the only rescue flight in town, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And what is Satan's goal in tempting us? And the answer is so that you don't get on the flight. So that you don't stay on the flight. If you get on, he try to get you out, and that you don't hold on to the flight. You see, there are many people who end up coming to the church and end up leaving the church for whatever reasons. What's happening? Because they have fallen into Satan's temptation. So let me、uh, remind you this morning: three things: stay on,、uh, get on, stay on, and hold on. 
Now, before we can stay on, stay, uh, get on, stay on, and hold on, Jesus must first triumph over Satan's temptation so that we may have actually a rescue flight to get onto. You see, that state is Jesus overcoming Satan's temptation is slightly different from us. His triumph is to achieve that rescue flight. And that takes us to the very famous temptation story in Matthew 4. One temptation in three parts. So we begin with Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus was very hungry. Now notice the setting of the temptation. It was in the wilderness, and it lasts for 40 days and nights. Now if you were a Jew, you immediately think about 40 and wilderness, 40 and wilderness. You remember what happened to the Israelites. They, were, they spent 40 years in the wilderness, but yet that was 40 years of sins and rebellion. If you read through the Old Testament, you know God reminded them again and again, it's 40 years, not of obedience, not of growth, not of learning, but 40 years of sins and rebellion. So it was no good. They were no good. And because they were no good, Jesus now had to come to take two. You know, so you uh, know how people make the movie and you try to shoot a scene and then it's NG. NG means no good. So now you have to take two. Jesus will come now. Not to repeat history, but to make up for their failure. Like David and Goliath, Jesus will become the King David who triumphed over Goliath for his people. Now I want you to notice one thing, Jesus' physical condition. Can you imagine someone who fasted not for 40 hours, but 40 days and night? And that's Jesus. What, what, what kind of condition would Jesus be in? Now, some people, uh, we don't understand. We think that, oh, Jesus, he got to be really strong because he's God, right? But no, he is 100% man. The theologian, the biblical scholar, keep emphasizing the fact that he is 100% man. That means at the end of 40 days and 40 nights of fasting, imagine how weak Jesus must be at the end of that time and at the beginning of the temptation. So when the temptation arrived, Jesus was extremely weak, extremely weak. Now, how are we to understand this extreme weakness of Jesus? Now, there are two angles we may look at it. The first angle is he triumphed over Satan despite his extreme vulnerability. Despite his extreme weakness, that's one angle. The second angle, which I think is a much better angle, is he triumphed over Satan precisely because he was in extreme weakness. So you see, what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that as you read through the gospel, you begin to see that what triumphed over Satan, the darkness, the power, the sin, and death is not strength, but weakness. Weakness is the key to triumph. So right here, we already begin to see a shadow of the cross. What will triumph over Satan? It's not power. It is weakness. It is the cross. The cross will become Jesus' final and ultimate victory. So now the test begins. Part A. Remember, we have part A, part B, and part C. Part A begins like this. If you were the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. If you were the Son of God, actually a better translation is since you are the Son of God. We know who you are. You are the Son of God. And the Son of God doesn't mean the divine Son of God. It means you are God's promised King and Savior. Since you are God's promised King and Savior, why don't you turn these stones into bread? Notice the plurals. It's not just, why don't you turn this little stone into a piece of bread for yourself? It's, why don't you turn these stones, how many stones? A lot of stones because we're in the wilderness. Why don't you turn this stone into bread? What kind of temptation is that? It is a temptation to become a savior king that have power and strength over weakness and infirmity. You see, Jesus now is extremely vulnerable. He is extremely weak. And Satan say, 
Why don't you become a king of power and strength? Turn these stones into bread. And that is the nature of this temptation. Now, later on in all four Gospels, we know Jesus would do one miracle. There was one miracle that Jesus did in all four Gospels, and that is feed 5,000 men with five loaves of bread, right, and two fish. And look at what happened after he did that. In John chapter 6, verse 14, when the people saw the sign, it was supposed to be a sign of the kingdom, but people don't understand the sign, so they take it as a miracle. When they saw the miracle, they said to each other, this is the prophet who is to come to the world. Who is that prophet? It's a prophet like Moses. Why is Moses the prophet? Because Moses is not just a prophet that talk. Moses is a prophet that deliver. Moses is a, pro- is a prophet that did a lot of miracles, the 10 place, take them out of Egypt into the promised land. That is the kind of prophet we want. We want someone, not with words, but with power. We want someone who can do miracle against the Romans, so they take us out of the Roman Empire into our own promised land. And they were about to take Jesus by force to make him king. That's the kind of God. That's the kind of king they wanted. They want a king with power. So what is the, what is the temptation to turn stone into bread, to become a savior king? That's all about power and strength, but nothing about weakness and infirmity. And to that, Jesus absolutely rejected that suggestion. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, and he answered, it is written, he's citing from the book of Deuteronomy, because they are in the wilderness, 40 years. Well, that's what Jesus was meditating on. And he said, he answered, it is written in Deuteronomy, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Jesus cited just one line, but we should really be thinking about the entire passage in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 8. Where is Deuteronomy? Some of you may remember Deuteronomy is actually Moses' last word. By the time Moses wrote Deuteronomy, 40 years have passed. Moses is near the end of his life. He will never make it to the promised land. So he gave his last sermon. He summarized the 40 years for them and teach them, warn them, plead with them that they should obey God. So that's what Paul, uh, Moses said in Deuteronomy chapter 8. You shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God had led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that you might that he might humble you, testing you to know what is in your heart, whether you would keep his commandment or not. God teaching them something. To what? To keep his commandment. Verse 3, And he humbled you and let you hunger. God gave them hunger to teach them something and fed you with manna which you did not know. God was gracious to supply them with manna from heaven, but God wanted them to wait while they Go hungry for a time that they may that he may make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. You see, God wants them to wait on his word, but sadly, every time they got hungry, what happened? They immediately grumble against the Lord. They don't wait on the Lord, they grumble against the Lord. And worse still, every time they grumble, they look back. They look back at Egypt and they say, we used to have hot pot in Egypt. Why are we here? We don't even have bread. And that is where the heart is. They wanted to go back to Egypt. And that's what made God really angry. And that is the very nature of the sin and rebellion. Verse 5 of Deuteronomy 8. Know then in your heart that a man disciplined his son, the Lord your God disciplined you, trained you. So you shall keep the commandment of the Lord your God by walking in his way and by fearing him. That's all God wants to do. He wants to train them up so that they will walk in his way, but they will not. They continue 40 years of rebellion, 40 years of falling into Satan's temptation. And here comes Jesus. He is no, he is nothing like the Israelite. He obeyed. He obeyed and he persevered in obeying God. He kept God's commandment and he insisted on, he persevered in doing God's will even to the point of death and death 
on the cross. Jesus is the reverse of the Old Testament Israel. Here, when we move from the Old Testament to the New Testament, we see Jesus as a son, but unlike the best son in the Old Testament, he is a good and obedient son who learned obedience through suffering. Although he was a son, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8, he learned obedience through what he suffered. So Jesus suffered in the wilderness. And what did he do? He suffered hunger and he learned obedience through the suffering of hunger. And it was that obedience that foreshadowed a much greater obedience a much greater obedience in the shadow of suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane. Verse 7, Jesus offered a prayer and supplication with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from that. Where did that happen? The Garden of Gethsemane. And just like in the wilderness, he learned obedience through suffering. So in the Garden of Gethsemane, he learned obedience in face of immense, immense suffering. And Jesus, final, final phrase, and he was heard. The Father hear Jesus. And the Father answered Jesus' cry for help. How? Not by giving Jesus a free pass. Not by Jesus giving Jesus a free pass from the cross, but by being, by raising him up on the third day. By the powerful resurrection, God raised Jesus up. On the third day. So that obedient son was heard by God and raised him up on the third day. So with that, Jesus triumphed over Satan in part A. He will persevere in suffering. That's level one. Now on to part B, level two. Level two began with something like this. Then the devil took him to a holy city to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, the Jerusalem temple, and said to him, if you are the son of God, since you are the son of God, right? Remember that? Since you are the son of God, why don't you prove yourself by throw yourself down? Now notice the change in location. Now we are no longer in the wilderness. I don't know whether it's a dream, it's an illusion, whatever, but now we have a change of location. The location is the holy city. The location is Jerusalem. The location is Jerusalem temple. And these are not just religious symbols. And sometimes we think about Jerusalem temple as a religious symbol, but they were actually political symbols. So the temptation here to, for Jesus to jump down from a very high point in the city, from the pinnacle of the temple, is to presume that he would draw a crowd. You know, so I don't know about you, but when I was little, when I imagined this temptation, I imagined an empty stadium, and that was not right. I should imagine a packed stadium, and Jesus now at the pinnacle of the uh, temple, and everybody waiting for him to jump down. And if you jump down, and it's okay, everybody will roar, and everybody will follow him, everybody will crown him, King. So what is the temptation? The temptation is that he will draw a following through a spectacular miracle. Now that temptation is similar, very similar to turning stone into bread, right? Turn stone into bread. People will make you king. You jump down, you survive, you triumph. People will make you king. Choose to be a savior king of power and strength. Our power. This is our, our power, Jesus. Do it. Do it. Not our of weakness. And Jesus will have nothing to do with it. Now, it's very interesting. Satan not only issued the temptation, he also give, cited a Bible verse in support of his suggestion. For it is written, for it's written in the book of Psalms, uh, in Psalms 91, for he will command this angel, his angel concerning you. On their hands, they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot. Again, the stone, think about how spectacular Jesus was falling, falling for seconds, and then angel appear holding him, and he have a safe landing. Satan was quoting from Psalm 91, verse 11 to 12. What kind of quotation is that? It's like a golden verse. It's completely out of contact. He had no regard for what Psalm 91 is. 
Very interesting. If you guys are trying to read Psalm 91, Psalm 91 is actually about a suffering king. It's about a suffering king waiting upon the Lord. It's about a suffering king that will trust in the Lord and not to, to, to win by his own strength. And it begins with something like that. I will say to the Lord, the suffering king, you are my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I will trust. But yet for Satan, instead of trust and wait on the Lord, the application becomes, why don't we seek a sign and test the Lord? Why don't we seek a sign and test on Instead of waiting on the Lord, why don't we test the Lord with asking for a sign? That's outrageous. So Jesus once again turned to Deuteronomy for a rebuke. And this time Jesus cited from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, if you are familiar with Deuteronomy, you will jump to just Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16. And there's something more, something detailed about Jesus. It doesn't just mean you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. One more thing. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Massa. That was what Jesus had in mind. It is the Massa test. Now, interestingly, Massa is an event that took place in Exodus 17, 40 years ago. Well, God really had a good memory, right? Or Moses had a good memory. Massa is such a defining moment for Israelite because Massa is representative of the entire 40 years. If you got a chance to read Psalm 95, you will know Massa is not just a one-time event. Israelite was Massa-like all the way, 40 years, they were living at Massa. So what happened at Massa? You've got a chance to go back to Exodus 17, you will read something like this. They have no water to drink. Okay, no water, fine, ask the Lord, no. They immediately got impatient with God. They quarreled with Moses and they tested the Lord. Now, I don't have time to go with you back to Exodus 17. But that thing is a lot more serious than simply grumble. They were putting God on trial, if you may say. They immediately hold a court. They set up their own legal system. And who is on trial? God is on trial. They want to put God to the trial. What is God's guilt? God's guilt is this. Why did you bring us out of Egypt? What is God's guilty of? Taking us out of Egypt. We love Egypt. Egypt is that forbidden word, is the four-letter word that you should not even mention. But yes, Israel could not resist that. So Massa is the kind of spiritual experience that covered the 40 years. Every time something happened, they grumble. Every time something happened, they think life is so much better at Egypt. Let's go back to Egypt. Why did you take us out of Egypt? Now, if... Part A of the temptation is about hunger, remember? Turning st stone into bread. Part B of the temptation can be said is about thirst, right? It's a temptation of massa. Now here in part B, we encounter two pictures of the temptation, which is pretty interesting. The first temptation is for Jesus to jump down from a high place. The second temptation is for Jesus to grumble against God, to test God in the time of extreme thirst, you may say that. Uh, interestingly, if you are familiar with the gospel, you will begin to think, wait a minute, both picture later on surface in Jesus' life. Both picture they surface, not separately, but together. Where are these two temptation pictures show up again in Jesus' life? It's at the cross. So when we move to Matthew chapter 27, when Jesus was hung on the cross, we heard the same temptation, if you are the son of God. You see that? It's the same thing. It's now only more extreme because he's not just in the wilderness or in the temple, pinnacle. He is somewhere on the cross. The temptation is so much greater because if he wants to end that suffering, he come down. So if you are the son of God, come down from the cross. Show us a miracle. Give us the hour of power. Jesus, you know, if you will jump down from the cross, if you can defeat your enemy, I guarantee millions and billions of people will be following you the rest of their life. You think about that. Become a savior and king of power and strength, not of weakness and 
infirmity. So that's part one of that temptation. There's another part. After this, Jesus said, I thirst. And Jesus is undergoing the massa temptation. But what happened to Jesus? He refused to jump down. And number what happened? He refused. He did not grumble against the Father in his extreme thirst. Why he thirst? He thirst because he was hung on the cross in midday. He thirst because he had been deserted by all his friends and disciples. Finally, he thirst because he was suffering the fire of hell for sinners like you and me. But he did not come down. He endured the cross. He endured to the very, very end. And that's where the story turned everything upside down because the 30 Jesus will not come down. When he died, he became a source of new life, the rivers of living water. Now, if you're familiar with John, you know what I'm talking about. You know, the soldier pierced his side. What came out of his side? Water and blood. Water and blood that will give new life to Sinners, everything got turned around because he endured it and endured it to the end. Matthew chapter 24, verse 43, he trusts God. Uh, people mock at him. Let God deliver him now if he desire him, if he desire him. For he said, I am the son of God. Yes, Jesus trusts in God, fulfilling Psalm 91. You see, Psalm 91 was trusting in God in times of great suffering for the king, not for you, not for me, for the king. Number two, he is truly the son of God. He is indeed the son of God. Number three, God did not forsake him. God answered his prayer. He promised to deliver and he did. Not on that day. Not on that day, but he delivered him on the third day with a powerful resurrection. So with this, Jesus triumphed over Satan in part B of the temptation. So another level passed. Finally, we'll get to the third level, the ultimate temptation. Verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Now, by, the, by now, the scope of temptation is getting bigger and bigger, right? It used to be, seems to be on a personal level. Then it's about the Israelite as a kingdom, the king of Israel. Now it's beyond the realm of Israel. The entire world, the entire world is at stake. And as this temptation expands and expands, Satan also reveals his true color. He no longer comes with a nice voice and say, if you are the king of the, since you are the king of the Jews, since you are the son of God. He came straight. Revealing his sole purpose. What is his sole purpose? It's for you to bow down before me. He's getting frustrated at Jesus. Please, Jesus, I just want one thing. Would you bow down and worship me? And to Jesus, Satan promised he will give him all the glories of the nations. Now, Satan claimed that he can give all nations to Jesus. And he elaborated that further in Luke chapter 4, verse 6, in Luke chapter 4, verse 6, Satan said this, For it has been delivered to me. The nations, the glory of the nation has been delivered to me, and I will give it to whom I will. Really? Really? Remember, Satan is a liar. So can you really believe everything he said? He said, the glory of the nation have been given me, and I can give to anyone I like. Had the nation been given to Satan. Perhaps there were one of you who are very sharp mind and familiar with your Bible, you may raise your hand and say, Pastor Lam, I thought the nation were actually promised to another guy. Another guy by the name of Abraham. Not Satan, but Abraham. Good thinking, keep that in mind. And we will come back to Abraham later on. So listen to Jesus' review. Jesus once again, cited from Deuteronomy. Be gone, Satan, verse 10, Matthew 4. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. The devil left him, and behold, angel came and ministering to him. 
Here comes the knockout punch, and this time is game over. How do we know it's game over? Because the devil left him, and angel came ministering to him. Have you watched a boxing match? I mean, not in real life, probably just on TV. You remember how at the end of boxing match when the referee declared winner, what happened? Well, the defeated one had to leave, and then the winning team member they burst in from the winning corner. Not to care for Jesus because Jesus is almost dead. No, but they raised Jesus up. He won. He won. He won. And that's what is happening here. Is celebrating the angels celebrating with Jesus of his win, his big win, not only for himself but for the entire world. So once again, Jesus is quoting from Deuteronomy, but this time. He went with the kill. He went to the very center of Deuteronomy, the most powerful part of Deuteronomy. Which part? Shema. So he went to Shema. He was citing from Deuteronomy chapter six, verse thirteen. But the entire paragraph began with Shema, the greatest commandment. It began something like this: Oh, hear, O Israel, Shema, O Israel. The Lord, our God, the Lord is one. There's only one of no one like Him. He is above all. You shall therefore love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That is the verse that Satan could not bear to hear, because Satan know that God is one, but Satan could not do the next thing, which is to bow before God to love Him. Satan hated God. So next time you get a visit from Satan at night in your dream or whatever, say Shema to Israel, and Satan will flee because he is disgusted about Shema. And Jesus cited Shema to Israel. Oh, God, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Therefore, it is the Lord you shall fear. He alone you shall fear, and him you shall serve, and by his name you shall fear, because he is one. You should fear him. And serve him only. No other gods, no other Satan, not even yourself. Now, if you pay attention to the flow of Shema passage from verse four all the way to thirteen, you realize there's something important sandwiched between four and thirteen. We find something about Abraham. Very interestingly, we find something about Abraham in verse ten. This is. After Shema, God said this, and when the Lord your God bring you into the land that He swore to Abraham to give to you, it's almost as if you connect the dot. Here come the promise, the coming promise from Yahweh. This is the ultimate promise from Yahweh. If you will love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, if you will serve Him and serve Him only. Connecting the dot. What will happen to you? You will get a sandwich, and what is in the middle of the sandwich? You will receive Abraham's promise. Interesting, right? If you will love him with all your heart, all your soul, if you will serve him only, the big hamburger. What do you get in the middle as the meat? You will receive Abraham's promise as a reward. What was promised to Abraham? Remember, the sharp guy among us already said, wasn't. The all nation. Then weren't the all nations promised to Abraham? Yeah, it was. So let me take you to the Abrahamic covenants. This is what is very familiar to many of us here. The ultimate promise in the Bible: Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And what will happen when you do that? When you obey, I will make you into a great nation. And in you, all the family, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. If you will obey me, you will become a great nation. If you obey me, all the country, all the nations of this world will be your people. Did Abraham leave? Well, yes, he did. He left Haran. Did he go? Well, he did. He went to Canaan as God has led him and show him. But did Abraham receive the nations? Well, he did not. In fact, he did not even have one great nation when he died. So, what happened to Abrahamic promise? Who will fulfill all these promises? Who will become a great nation? Who will bless the nation of this world? The answer is a descendant from Abraham. 
The answer is the son of Abraham. There was one promised child. There was one promised son, one promised king that will become king not only of Israel, but of all nations. And who is that? We know that that is Jesus. So what happened to Jesus? What did Jesus do? Did he leave? Yeah, he did. He left heaven. He left his father's house, not on earth, but in heaven. Did he go? Yes, he did. Where did he go? He went where the Lord had shown him. He went to the Promised Land, to Canaan. He went to Jerusalem. He went to Golgotha. He went to the cross. Everything got narrower and narrower, and he stayed on the cross. The cross is where God showed that he should go, and he went and he stayed on the cross. And so it is the cross that saved us. It's the cross where Jesus inherits, fulfill all the promises. It is through the cross that the nations will become not of the Satan, but of Jesus, a son of Abraham. A great nation came out of Jesus' empty tomb. A great nation will come out. Because of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the nation, and with that, Jesus triumphed over Satan in part C of the temptation. So I want to summarize now, since we're done with part A, B, and C. I want to summarize for you what the temptation overcoming life is. I want to summarize it in three points. We'll start with Jesus, and eventually by Point number three will move to us. Point number one: How did Jesus overcome Satan's temptation by becoming or by being obedient, by being obedient unto death, by being obedient and self-denying son, unlike Israel, who is all about them, who is all about their tummy, their hunger and their thirst. Jesus is obedient and self-denying son. Point number one. Point number two is about Jesus. How did Jesus triumph not only for himself, but for Adam, for Israel, and for the nation? Well, he became crucified for us. It's on the cross as a crucified king. Remember, not the hour of power, but the hour of weakness and infirmity that won us blessings to the nation. This world craves for power and strength. That's why we want to watch the hour of power, right? Because we all crave for that, but Jesus showed us something absolutely of another world. It is through his infirmity, his weakness on the cross, that he won us blessing and blessing for the nation. Now, finally, about us: How do we triumph over Satan's temptation? And the answer is by becoming God's people, made in the Son's image. Jesus triumphed Satan's temptation with the cross. Guess how are the Christians, Jesus' people, going to triumph over Satan's temptation by carrying the cross? What is the temptation overcoming life? Is a self-denying, cross-carrying life in obedience to King Jesus? What is a temptation overcoming life for you? A temptation overcoming life is. Self-denial. Take up your cross and follow him. Let me take you to Matthew chapter sixteen, verse twenty-three. This is where Jesus' elder disciple Peter is under attack, under Satan's temptation. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, "Get behind me, Satan!" That sounds familiar, right? That Jesus said, "Go away, Satan! Get behind me! Go away, Satan!" It is the same thing. Why? Because Peter has fallen into Satan's temptation. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Peter has fallen into Satan's temptation. How so? What happened before is Peter was rebuking Jesus. Jesus have just made another prophecy about what I will go to Jerusalem and I will suffer in Jerusalem. I will be rejected by all, and I will die on the third day. I will be raised, and Peter objected to it. Peter said, "No, you're not going to do that. Why? 
Because I, Peter, have invested three years of my life to follow a king. I want money. I want payback. I want reward. And I will not take any king with a cross. That's what Peter is saying. Peter wants the hour of power. And Jesus said, I have chosen the hour of weakness and infirmity and death and shame. And Peter said, I will not follow a king with a cross. Peter wants a king without a cross. Peter wants the glory of this world, but not the glory of Jesus. So Jesus came and we built Peter and then Jesus continue his teaching. Tell us how we are to overcome Satan's temptation. And this is how. If anyone would come up to me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. That's how you win the temptation. For whoever will save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. This is the temptation over coming life. What does it mean to deny ourselves? What does it mean to take up our cross? Let me take you to the very beginning, the two iconic pictures that I show you. Now remember, God's deep desire is for us sinners to do three things with his rescue flight, to get on, to stay on, and to hold on. And Satan's temptation aims to undo the three things so that we don't get on, so that we don't stay on, and we don't hold on. So let me ask you, who of all this world will actually get on, stay on, and hold on? And the answer is, people who deny himself and take up the cross. You understand? If you don't deny yourself and take up the cross, you will not get on, you will not stay on, and you will not hold on. What does it mean to deny ourselves and take up the cross? If you, some of you remember from my math sermon, I used three points to summarize, deny yourself, take up the cross. What does it mean for someone to deny himself and take up the cross? Point number one, this person began to realize that before the holy God, I am but a great sinner. What does it mean for someone to take up the cross? 2,000 years ago in Middle East, if you see someone walking through the street on a cross, carrying a cross, it means this is a great sinner, right? It means this is a great sinner. This, this person deserved death and deserved death of the worst kind. Who can get on God's rescue flight? Oh, who can get on? Well, the one who know himself to be a sinner. And to that, Satan will come in and whisper, his lie. What will Satan say to you if you are thinking about getting on to the gospel? Satan will whisper in your ear, in the world of morality, you are one good man. Well, I should use person to cover the, all the genders. In the world of morality, you are one good man. Why do you believe all these stupid things that Pastor Lamb is talking about? What sin? What all have sinned and foreshadowed the glory of God, the wages of sin is dead. All this nonsense. We are more than people. We solve problems. We don't need to believe in these fake, vague sin and hell and all that. That is the lies from Satan. Which of the two will you believe in? You have to deny yourself, deny all your righteousness, carrying your cross, know that you are a great sinner before God. Then you can get on. But after you get on, you have to stay on. Who are the people who will stay on? The people who stay on are the people who forsake the wealth and the fame of the world. Let me, let me make it clear to you, Afghanistan. To forsake the fame and the wealth of Afghanistan. Now that's clear, right? But Hong Kong is different. Hong Kong is real, real, real deal. Hong Kong is real comforts and wealth and fame. No, Hong Kong is just like Afghanistan. To forsake the wealth and fame of this world, seek the kingdom. These are the people who stay on. We have seen so many people who get on, so to speak, while well, they're willing to come and be baptized into a church, and then the next year they disappear. Why? They love the world too much. There are too many things happening in this world. This is the truth. You have to forsake the wealth and the fame and seek after the kingdom. We are in the air. We are flying to a new land. Guess what? There are people jumping off the flight because they love Afghanistan too much. I can't believe it. But Satan is a good liar. 
He lied to them, and people believe in it. And Satan will say, before the eternity comes, diversify your investment. You don't have to be all in. Don't believe all these things that Jesus talked. You just want to aim high so that you don't fail too badly. He doesn't really mean that you have to go into the kingdom with all your might and all these things. No, 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 don't worry. You see, the church full of people who are half-hearted. How can it be that the demand is so high? You know, Jesus is just talking. Diversify your investment. And the answer is no, no, no. These are the lies. You have to forsake the wealth and fame of this world. You have to seek God's kingdom with all your heart. And finally, the people who deny themselves and take up the cross are the people who hold on. So we have people who get on, people who stay on, and we finally, we need to have people who hold on. Why? Because the gospel is going to bring suffering. The gospel is going to bring rejection. The gospel is going to bring persecution. What does it mean to carry out cross and follow Jesus? It means preaching Christ crucified. Now, if you don't believe me, read your New Testament. Really read your New Testament. Read Paul's letter, and Paul will tell you why he got persecuted. Because he preached Christ crucified. He preached the hour of weakness, not the hour of power. It's simply said, and because of that, he was rejected by many people. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because the gospel is going to give us strength, or give us shame. And to that, Satan, the liar, will whisper in your ear, preach Christ victorious and winning favor from man. You, you, you know what I mean? Don't talk about sin. You don't have to. Give testimony. Positive, positive testimony. Not, no negativity. There are certain words you shouldn't utter at church, like sin, guilt, punishment, judgment, hell, fire. Eliminate all these things. Very God loves God loves you so much. Now we have a brother who just experienced God's miraculous healing last week. He's going to come and give us a testimony. We have another person who just found his perfect uh, wife or husband. You know they're going to get married in two months' time. Now here you go. Let them give the testimony. Preach Christ victorious and winning man's favor. Where does it come from? Not from the Bible. It came from the evil one. Three truths, three lies. And so may the Lord grant us wisdom. I'm running out of time. That we may discern Satan's lies. And also we may have courage to live out the truth of God. If you kind of at the loss of all this thing that I've said, remember the two pillars that we have been saying again and again from the very beginning. You just need to pray two things. Be merciful to me, a sinner. That's how you get on. Once you pray that, once you realize that you are a great sinner before God, a holy God, you are on. You can get on the flight. But you have to pray the second prayer. Store up for me treasures in heaven, not in Egypt, not in Hong Kong, not on earth, but in heaven. Then that's how you stay on. Only prayers and life like this will make us get on stay on and hold on to the rescue flight that is in Christ crucified. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, as we are about to celebrate, celebrate the Lord's Supper, remind us it is a call for us to get on for some of us who are not yet Christian and for those who are to stay on and to hold on to remind us that Christ gave us everything so we may have this rescue flight. And he speaks truth to all of us to send his Holy Spirit to come to our heart so that we may know that Hong Kong is no different from Afghanistan, that we have dangers all over the place. This is no time, no place to be complacent. Rather, it is a time to get on, stay on, and hold on. Help us to look to Jesus. Celebrate this meal with a determination, with a dedication that we will stay on, that we will hold on. Pray that you will give us strength to proclaim the true gospel to the end of this world. We pray all that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.